this drive, what is this? Uh, okay. So again, welcome, sorry, uh, something popped up on my screen, but I would like again to welcome everybody. And this is the July event for the July issue. This is what we're here for, to introduce and to present, um, well, to introduce two authors that, that have uh, written for us uh, for transitions, a postgraduate journal, uh, the project, uh, a postgraduate uh, project uh, at Sapienza University of Rome, in particular to in, at the Department of European American Intercultural Studies. And also we would like to present the July issue, uh, Imagining Communities, uh, which has been uh, edited by me and Andrea Lupi, who is here with me. And also I would like to introduce uh, Fabio Ciambella, a professor of English and second language acquisition at Sapienza University of Rome, uh, which, if I'm not wrong, you, Professor Ciambella, you have followed us since the, the March event, since the very beginning. Yes, of course. So uh, you have been able to, to follow a bit the evolution of this project. And so the first thing I would like to ask you is what do you think about it? And what do you think about the project inside our department? Okay, so, well, uh, I, I wouldn't like to start by saying it's a good project, you know, okay, fantastic, uh, it's our department, we, we, we all know this. Uh, what I can see and what I could see since the very beginning of this project is that uh, things are uh, done uh, um, quite well. I mean, it's not so um, easy to find uh, people that work like this to create um, basically uh, an academic journal uh, that is not only an academic journal, journal as, we, as we will see. Um, and um, also, I mean, it's, it's not easy, uh, and probably some of you will, will have the opportunity to experiment uh, after university uh, what, um, what it means being part of an academic journal and all the things you have to do and uh, people from other universities who are not so serious in, in working uh, in such an environment, especially when, uh, when a journal is considered to be very important. Uh, and so I have to say that this is the right uh, the right beginning of uh, uh, of an academic uh, journal and, and future career, Leonardo. Um, so uh, I would like to start by saying that, of course, this is a very uh, important opportunity for uh, all students, both at BA and and MA, uh, especially uh, at Sapienza, uh, because. Um, students from from university can contribute to this journal um, basically in in two different ways they can be both uh, or either it depends <laughs> authors or members of the uh, of the of the editorial staff and this and this gives uh, uh, different advantages to to students i think on the one side we have authors that of course can contribute to to the different issues of uh, of the journal and and i forgot to tell you that, that i i really appreciate the fact um that this journal offers different sections uh, one dedicated to uh, academic writing i mean writing essays about something uh, and but also a very um important section about creative writing that uh, that i think uh, must not be undervalued at all. I mean, I, I've read in advance the, uh, the the three pieces of creative writing and I'm going to, to, to talk about them later, but I really appreciated also the, the, um, the section dedicated to, to creative writing. So as I was saying before, uh, students can be authors, so write and, and also participate in workshops uh, uh, about academic or creative writing, it depends. And I think that it, it is a very good opportunity because when I was at university, not so many years ago, I have to admit, um, no one uh, told me, okay, if you want to write a journal article, you have to start by 
saying something like with an introduction, with with, uh, with the evidence, uh, you have to give data and so on and so forth. So the workshops, I think, are very good opportunities to um, that, that are offered uh, thanks to transitions, uh, and of course also taking part in in the events organized by Journal. And then, as I was saying before, apart from being authors, uh, students can be members of the editorial staff, and this means. Uh, first of all, applying, uh, answering the, the calls for applicants that are pub published on uh, Facebook. I've seen them also on, on Instagram because I follow both the uh, Facebook and Instagram uh, page of, uh, of transitions. Um, and working out professional um, environment, of course. And um, I mean, uh, we have to also to be real and, and concrete sometimes, also to acquire uh, university credits that are useful for your for your your career and uh, by now um, being a student at the Magistrale uh, at Sapienza and a student at Sapienza means um, obtaining up to four uh, credits and this is very important of course for your um, for your career and also uh, if you are part of the Percorso di Eccellenza uh, working with transitions can be a good opportunity to um, to obtain some hours uh, that are part of this particular uh, particular path um, of study. Um, so this is basically all I had to <laughs> to tell you here now at, at the beginning. So Leonardo, am I right? Okay. Yeah, it has been great because uh, indeed you describe all the opportunities that the students have uh, partaking to our projects. And also, I think it is um, very important to remark that, for example, our issue is titled Imagining Communities. And community is central to the project itself, creating a community, working together. And in this case, I will actually call Andrea Lupi to talk about this, because you have yes. something to say about community. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Leonardo. And Professor Tambella for your introduction. Uh, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, well, community has been a key word for transition since the beginning of the project. And we, when we set up the group and when we, was, when we were working on the first issue, the idea of a topic, of an issue entirely dedicated to the topic of community came up to us and we were really keen on working on that because we thought that the group, the, the, the editorial staff, was actually a community and was a place in which people belonged to a community and brought up a communal work. And so we thought it fitting to reflect on the processes that bring uh, communities together. And, um, on this line, I, I would like to make some acknowledgements and I would like to uh, thanks the whole editorial staff for uh, having contributed to this uh, product which we are uh, introducing today and which is the result of the, um, of the workings of, of a community. I would like to thank the HR team for taking care about uh, managing events, managing communication between uh, the members of the staff between uh, external members and authors. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, social media and graphics team for creating those beautiful uh, graphics and flyers. And um, they've been a great part um, to the project and for sharing also on social media uh, news about the events and, um, and the issue on the whole. Uh, I would like to thank also the editorial team. Uh, without them, we wouldn't have an issue of such a high quality, of such a high uh, attention to the detail. And uh, in relation to this, I have to thank our wonderful two co-editors in chief, uh, Paolo Di Invinosante and Silvia Gatti, whom I saw before, uh, for giving us a hand whenever there was uh, the need for them. Um, and Leonardo and I are really grateful to them and also um, especially to uh, our production editors, uh, Caterina Napolitano and Valerio Monticelli, whom I also saw before, uh, for uh, putting so much of effort into the last week into creating the final 
PDF for bringing the project to life. And of course, last but not least, the authors. Um, without the authors, we wouldn't have these issues and we wouldn't have such wonderful contributions. We're really proud of this issue because it is the first one which includes contributions from uh, students outside of Sapienza. And uh, it is really important that we create a web, uh, a network of students which uh, reach further and reach beyond the walls of, of, our, of our own university. Well, first of all, the topic and the focus on the issue is not so much on community on, on the whole, but we've wanted to focus on the processes that bring community together, that bring people together to shape and form a community. And we thought that 40 years, almost 40 years actually, um, after the publication of uh, Imagined Communities by the um, British historian Benedict Anderson, there was the need to rethink the way in which we contribute to communities. And we felt that communities aren't stable notions, fixed labels to apply, but we felt there was a urge um, to, to, to focus on the processes that bring people together, on how communities are, uh, are identity in flux, uh, that are constantly being shaped and reshaped. And so that was why we wanted, um, in a quite hazardous way, we could say, uh, to change the title into Imagining Communities. And indeed, the contributions in this issue focus on the idea of language um, as a means through which communities are established, uh, even if it's a temporal um, effort, even if these identities all contribute to create communities in such a way that each individual is part of a community and each community owes something to that individual. And um, this is really encapsulated also in the foreword in which uh, also through the example of Leonardo's, um, Leonardo's example about the own <laughs> of, the, of the planet of the apes, uh, because our focus, we are uh, students, uh, we, we study literature, linguistics, um, and language is um, a quite important framework for us. Working with language and through language is essential for us, whether we study literature or linguistics. And we wanted to focus on how language creates, enhances, and limits the workings of a community. And uh, this way, we wanted to create a shift towards another model of community, which is uh, in which people interact with each other, uh, in which they encounter and uh, they create a tension which can either be positive or negative, but which certainly will uh, eventually bring up the product of a different community, a community in which individual individuals are part of and uh, can uh, reflect and mirror their own identity. And uh, just let me share with you uh, the cover of the issue because uh, I think this is the most perfect visual uh, imagination in which uh, we wanted to express our concept of community. First of all, uh, a big thanks to Caterina Napolitano for uh, taking care of the cover art, um, Leonardo and I, first fell in love with it. And um, we're really grateful to her for having created such a wonderful cover. And we do think that the cover really expresses this idea of imagining communities. These 23 ends all belong to each member of the staff and they projects the idea of transitions as a community in which each individual with his or her, his or her own skills competences and ideas, bring uh, ideas and concepts together to, um, to form a community in which these ends um, overlap with each other because um, we wanted to emphasize the idea that people are always uh, on the verge of encountering other, the other and on the verge of shaping their own identity in relation to the encounter with the other. And that's what we wanted to 
uh, express and uh, have visual uh, in the in the first page in the cover actually uh, of the of the issue. Now, uh, let me briefly go to the uh, table of contents to show you and give you a brief overview of the contents which you will be able to find uh, in the uh, July issue of Transitions. First of all, we have two main sections, one being the academic writings and the other being the creative writing. In the academic writing, we begin with the contribution of Isabella Agostino, a student from uh, Ca Foscari University in Venice, whom reflects on the workings of language in relation to communities, on uh, bringing the example of two different and key um, 20th century theorists like Anna Arendt and Audre Lorde, Agostino reflects on the fear to bring people together, especially in the case of those uh, underrepresented communities which need fear uh, as, 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 a, as an effective value which can spark the communal, uh, the communal framework. Um, Guy Ramazzotti's paper instead uh, linguistic representation of social and ethnic otherness, Romanism on screen, reflect on the oppositions between uh, communities. In this case, the Romani communities, the Romani community against the other, the, the non-Romani community. Um, focusing on the uh, dichotomy of them and us, uh, Ramazzotti brings together um, two major uh, works in, in the field of audiovisual products, which are uh, Suburra and uh, Peaky Blinders, to reflect on, on how fictional dialogue can spark ideological, can have ideological implications on how communities are represented. Um, the third paper is instead written by Julia Castellano, whom we, ha we have the pleasure to have here today. And, follows the flow on the reflection of, on language and our language creates and sparks um, communal identities in the field of English as a lingua franca, and especially in the context of uh, uh, computer-mediated communication. Our empirical studies shows how um, communities can also adopt uh, creative uh, strategies and uh, less um, um, ways that differ from the standard norms in order to uh, project uh, individuals into a communal uh, outlook. Martina Sibilla's paper is instead focused on uh, Alexandria Casacortes' general election victory speech. And um, her paper will be um, focusing on uh, a set of tools offered by critical discourse analysis in our case We've got the we, in, the inclusive we, intertextuality, informality, and the use of metaphors to approach a specific dialogue, dialogue through the lens of the dichotomy, the opposition between the individual and the community. And in our case, um, the results will show how Alexandra Ocasio Cortez, through language, manages to envision a community which is rooted in a specific area of New York, the Bronx area but also at an international level. Last but not least, our creative writing section. Uh, Professor Ciambella has already made a little spoiler uh, by saying that it's uh, a wonderful section and I have to agree the contributions to this section. Uh, these issues are really, really great. Um, we begin with Leonardo Bagnolo's sonnet, Poetic Grant number one, in which Leonardo reflects on the workings of community following the structure of a sonnet to imply on how individuals face each other's strategy, tragedies, each other's um, emotions and, and, and affective values in order to um, imply also the inner workings of, of, of the individual in relation to a community. We've got then an entangled uh, composition uh, which mirrors the title that it has been given, which uh, is Entanglement by Michela Adinolfi, in which the author chooses to uh, adopt poetry and prose as two means uh, equally relevant to reflect on uh, the inner spaces um, that we can find between the individuals and 
uh, the other, the, the relationship which is built uh, with the other. And in her visionary uh, writing through the um, language of and the contents offered by quantum physics, Adinolfi takes on this journey throughout the relationship and the interaction between the eye and the other. Um, the last piece of which we will offer just the first part uh, to force you to read the November issue in order to know what will uh, eventually happen uh, is 23 by Caterina Napolitano. And she follows these um, almost hallucinatory, fantastic uh, strain which was anticipated um, by Michela Dinolfi. And she reflects on what it means to be part of a community and what it means not to feel part of it, not to feel part of it, especially in the case of uh, this character who wakes up on, on, on the day of his birthday to know that he doesn't belong to his community anymore. And, to, and we find, we can read in our text, the quest towards an identity, towards the understanding of what it means to be uh, an individual, what it means to have an identity that doesn't fit within a community. Uh, well, I think that's, uh, that's all for me uh, from uh, the issue. I hope you will, um, you will enjoy it and you will enjoy today's event. And uh, we're also looking forward to hearing from you uh, afterwards in the uh, Q&A section. Thank you very much. So, uh, Professor Chambella, as you said earlier, you had uh, the chance to, to read in advance a bit of this uh, yeah. July issue. Uh, would you like to give us some, I don't know, some feedback, some comments? Yeah, I, I can, and I actually want. So, um, a, a couple of things about this, this issue. Mm, I mean, as I actually, as I expected, it is a very fresh, uh issue i mean uh, it is the launching event the first issue of the of the journal and i expected it to be very uh, fresh and original and, and it, it actually is i mean I, I was at i actually am in verona now and i uh, attended uh, a kind of launching event of another journal here but not by by students, but by some colleagues of mine. And I have to admit that the, 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 the difference between this journal and, and transitions is quite evident. I mean, sometimes we as, as professors tend to be boring, okay? And also this launching event was boring the, uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and, and this is probably the main, the main difference between what students do and uh, and what um, and what academics do, and I really hope one day when you when you become academics, you won't be so boring as we as we are. And and this is and this is uh, um, something I really I really hope. Um, and then a very very strong point of these of this journal, and I, and I want to repeat it. Uh, is this uh, division between uh, academic writing and creative writing. Uh, because journals today in Italy and in the rest of Europe, but also in, in the US and other parts of the world, um, focus on uh, exclusively on, uh, on academic writing. And at a certain point, it becomes a kind of challenge uh, between scholars um, about who, who manages to uh, give the best and the most accurate data of all, uh, also by criticizing what other scholars um, had done before, uh, but also in, in very recent in very recent articles. And the, uh, and I really think that this is not what transitions is aimed is aimed at actually. Uh, and and I really and I really appreciate this. Um, this kind of uh, of mission that the transition has, and of course, it, it couldn't be otherwise, given that the name of the first issue, is, I mean, the title of the first issue, is uh, imagining communities, and so uh, thinking about communities and not not as a challenge. I mean, not as a as a fight or as a war um, of um, people, 
but I mean, uh, being together as part of a um, of a community. Uh, what uh, this is the I mean the the po these are the positive aspects of of this issue. Uh, but also, I um, I expected also something else that unfortunately is not here, but probably in the next issue. Why not? Uh, I uh, imagined also a kind of analysis about uh, contemporary society, contemporary communities um, after Brexit on the one side and after pandemics on the other. And this is something that doesn't happen, but of course, this is something you can work on in, in, the, in the next issues, because I mean, uh, this is uh, absolutely uh, feasible. Um, because I think that when we talk about, um, in this particular case, English language, English, English linguistics, and I'm quite surprised that no um, articles about English literature or American literature are, are, are present. Um, and I have to admit, uh, it's quite, uh, I'm quite happy about it. But apart from this, um, I was saying that, um, I mean, um, when we talk about English language, we have to take into consideration also the, the particular moment we are living. Uh, I mean, this is not referee, <laughs> it's the actual situation we, we are living now. So um, I, I would imagine a kind of uh, uh, post Brexit and post-pandemic uh, community. And this is probably uh, something uh, food for thought for you when you are going to uh, think about the, the next issues of, uh, uh, of transitions. Uh, so basically, these, these are my impressions about these, this launching um, issue of of transitions that I repeat, it's a very a very fresh and and original contribution to the to, to the academic um, Italian environment. And also, I, I really I really appreciate the fact that it makes me think that we we have a future. I mean, when I when students ask me, can can I can I write my final dissertation with you? I say okay, but. In the bottom of my heart, I'm quite um, scared uh, about what, what, I, what I'm going to face while people write uh, their final thesis or, or dissertation. And sometimes it's quite um, painful for me, okay? But then I read <laughs> articles about MA students. <laughs> I mean, I, I read this article and I say, okay, th there's hope. And so for, for a better future and people that can uh, write in English, in, a, in very good English and something very uh, important and I mean, with, with sense uh, for, uh, for our academic community. And so uh, I really would like, this is, this is my thank you actually uh, for this kind of opportunities and this kind of opportunities for you, but also for us to, to, read, your, to read your papers. It is certainly true. And we have to thank the authors for this because obviously without them, it would, it would not be possible uh, to have this project. We have an editorial team. When it comes to the issue without authors, we are done. I mean, <laughs> that, that's factual. And about this, now I think it's time to introduce the, the two authors of the two essays that we're going to, to talk about to, to, this evening. Uh, the first one I would like to introduce is uh, Giulia Castellano. Uh, she graduated in modern languages for international communication in Roma 3 uh, University. Uh, with an MA thesis on self-representation and identity within the visual narratives on Instagram. And now I really would like to uh, find her among the audience. Uh, here there. Voila. <laughs> Hi, Julia. Hi, Leonardo. Thank you How for you? introducing me. I'm good. <laughs> Um, the second student I would like to introduce is uh, Martina Shibilia. Martina is an MA student in Engl uh, of English Anglo American Studies. She graduated um, in Sabianza University uh, with a BA degree. 
in intercultural and linguistic mediation. And she has an interest in including uh, audiovisual translation, gender studies, and political discourse analysis. And again, I would like to welcome you uh, among the guests. How are you? Hi, thank you. How are you? Ah, well, the event is going extremely well. And now I guess we, it, it is time to pass to the to your to your work to your to the essays that you uh, published uh, in transitions and perhaps the first one Julia uh, it's yours yes because it, it was extremely interesting to uh, to read and to work with you uh, to read your essay and to work with you for the publication um, and you the, the title. Can, can, you, can you tell us the, the title of your, um, Andrea has, has told us something about this, but I would like to hear something from you about it. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I didn't expect, I wasn't expecting the, like you asked the but, um, title, which no. I don't remember at the moment, like, okay. Um, so. Let me, if you have it um, oh, you, you, there, you can read the title. The but... essay is, is on uh, ELF, Elf, in English as a lingua franca, uh, used yes, exactly. uh, in WhatsApp chats, I believe. And certainly, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, transitions uh, as, as the, end, say, the beautiful environment that you analyze, use English as an, the main language for communication. That's the point of English as a lingua franca, when not necessarily there are um english native speakers uh and yet english is used as mm -hmm. for community community um objectives or, uh, goals and so and you have an, analyzed another case in uh, in which this happened yes um exactly so my interest in analyzing how English has become an intercultural medium of communication comes from the wide use of this language when people interact um, through digital media, um, digital means of communication, such as in this case, WhatsApp. So therefore, English as a lingua franca and computer mediated communication are the key terms of my essay. And um, so, in this essay, I decided to delve uh, into a discourse analysis of select, selected WhatsApp group chats because these concepts, so um, EAF and CMC, are definitely, definitely broad, very broad concepts. So um, the chat were chosen in light of a com um, common team or purpose for their creation, which was to get people together and people who share actually the same passion for sport climbing. So the um, participants had different social, cultural and linguistic backgrounds. And my attention was drawn by how a socialization among people with different first languages is facilitated by the role of lingua franca that English has acquired. And in this case, um, uh, English, of course, German and Italian were the um, most used languages in the, in the chats. Um, so um, actually, as a matter of fact, um, CMC has contributed to the acceleration of the spread of English as a commonly shared code of communication. And um, in a study by Vettorel and Franceschi, it is pointed out how the, um, certain features are shared by English as lingua franca and CMC, despite this concept being um, related to different environments. So, um, so um, they could both share the feature of translocality, which applies to human interactions that are uh, increasingly taking on a mobile and virtual uh, dimension, regardless of spatial context. And they also seem to have a high degree of hybridity, fragmentation, and fluidity, and to use non-normative or innovative, um, innovative language features in relation to pragmatic and social circumstances. So what I found particularly intriguing is uh, when participants face new words or when they discover additional meanings of a word they already know. And so I'm going to give you a 
brief example of how playing an award and exploring linguistic possibilities um, seem to help participants acquire um, acquired it in their personal vocabulary. So the, um, the word in the term in question is fancy, which um, was mostly known by the participants for its function as an adjective. For example, like what a fancy dress, in this case, fancy is an adjective. But so when one of them used uh, fancy as a verb, so like, do you fancy going somewhere? Um, so the others got involved in codifying the meaning, which they were not used to. And uh, as soon as they began to understand how the, um, to use fancy as a verb, uh, some of them also started to use the various functions of fancy as a pun. For example, um, one participant goes like, um, you guys go if you fancy, and then another answers. So let's see if somebody fences, um, written like with the with an e, and the third one answers with uh, an emoji of someone fencing. So we go from fancy the verb to fencing the sport, and then when something was not really, um, uh, so when someone was not really uh, approving. Um, a word or a sentence, um, these reply, um, are, um, some of them replied like, oh, this is dispensing. So that was um, uh, like an interesting way um, to see how people um, behave when they uh, got to use a new or a new term in their language, in English, of course. And um, as you were saying, CMC, computer mediated communication, this is helping uh, the spread of English uh, as a shared code uh, of communication. Yes. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, we can. Uh, okay, great. And Professor Ciambella, uh, you, as, as I said at the beginning, you also teach second language acquisition. This is something important and technology is becoming more and more important in, uh, in, in teaching language and in, the, in teaching of English and as any other language. Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, not so, um, not WhatsApp so much. Uh, I have to admit that. But new technologies, of course, are the uh, um, I would say the new frontier of second language acquisition and uh, uh, the teaching of English in general. Um, and of course, uh, what kind of the, the first uh, the first problem or the first issue uh, is of course what kind of English. And as <laughs> as Leonardo said when when we were organizing this meeting, Elf is beautiful. English as a lingua franca is beautiful. Uh, actually. Uh, is, I don't know if it's beautiful or not, but this is the kind of English that is going to uh, to spread around the world uh, with peculiar characteristics. Uh, and these characteristics are somehow um, improved uh, by new technologies, uh, especially if we consider uh, Mm, new technologies, both for, um, I mean, aim to teach English, but also to, to learn English as, for example, corpus linguistics, um, uh, corpus linguistics software. Uh, I use them a lot uh, also in my, in my second language acquisition, uh, in my second language acquisition courses. And there are uh, simplified versions of the software that are used by students uh, uh, and they are aimed uh, at improving uh, English and um, especially English as, as a lingua franca. And, and these software are, are trying to, to demonstrate, I mean, re um, research uh, with, uh, with the aid of these software is demonstrating uh, that, for example, the third person S is not so much important when we talk about uh, communication, okay? This is something that we probably knew already uh, before the, the advent of corpus linguistics software. Um, but, I mean, they are, uh, they are contributing to, uh, to affirm this kind of uh, assertions about, about the English language. So we can say that, of course, 
uh, learning English through new technology also uh, makes uh, students, uh, high school or university, it depends, makes students understand and enter in contact with a different kind, not variety, but with, with a different kind of English uh, that we were not mm, accustomed before, that we probably uh, didn't know before. And this, I think, is the main role that new technologies are having today uh, in, uh, uh, in the teaching of, uh, of English and uh, foreign languages in general, but of course, uh, especially in English, because as uh, Julia's article uh, has demonstrated, of course, chat groups um, of people belonging to different nationalities uh, and with different linguistic backgrounds are mainly, of course, of course, in English. And um, sometimes uh, it, it's fantastic to understand uh, how people uh, can understand each other, even if their linguistic background is not common. And, and this is the case of English as a lingua franca through the, the chat groups that, 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 that Julia dealt with in her article. But I think, and this is probably uh, um, something I, I want to, to tell Julia about her article, probably even the, the analysis on the errors and mistakes uh, committed by uh, people, students in, in these chat groups would be uh, very, very interesting uh, and also thought provoking uh, to, to also to, to tailor um, courses of English, um, of English as a lingua franca, um, of course, and this probably uh, can be an opportunity for, for Julia to develop um, her, her research about uh, the article she she wrote. Do you agree, Julia? Yes, I, I do to. agree. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, of course. And also, I find it also interesting to see what mistakes are related to the medium, so the um, digital medium, and what are related to the knowledge of the language. So that is yes. pretty interesting to me, the difference. Mm -mm. Um, in transitions, we use different um, apps to communicate. We have, for example, both an, um, an WhatsApp group and uh, a te Telegram group, uh, yes, I believe. In one, generally, sometimes we speak in English, sometimes we speak in Italian. It's very confusing. Sometimes you switch between those and you create it's a very interesting um, linguistic productions. And I don't know. And Andrea, also when we, we when we do the meetings with the whole with the whole staff, um, speaking in English, obviously, since uh, we also have uh, international students among us, uh, I I think it might be interesting. We should take into consideration that you know recording and then studying them. You know, some publication might come out. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. There would be probably really creative solutions as those uh, from, uh, which Julia has been uh, outlining uh, lately. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> there will be some creations made up uh, while our brains try to communicate with each other when we don't even know the ideas which come up on our mind. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a mess. It's a mess, honestly, but uh, it would be interesting. Yeah, sure. <laughs> You're probably a very important um, corpus to, to build up. Your, your chat groups can be a very important uh, and interesting uh, corpus to, to be studied. <laughs> Taking transition as uh, an exam subject, you know. It's a case study, <laughs> yeah. And to, to the next essay, Martina, uh, this time you, you, you also focused on community, but on another aspect. Uh, in your paper, you used um, critical discourse analysis to analyze, to analyze a speech by uh, Congresswoman of Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Um, and is there any particular reason for your interest in, uh, in CDA applied to political discourse analysis? 
Um, well, actually, I'm quite new to critical discourse analysis. I, uh, in 2018, I wrote my bachelor dissertation about uh, fourth wave feminism, and I focused on speeches by Emma Watson, Chimamanda Adichie, and Malala Yousafzai. Uh, but it was much more descriptive than analytic, I would say. Uh, so uh, CDA actually gave me the uh, tools to analyze political speeches in a much more um, academically suitable way. Uh, and, it also, and I also think it gave me, it granted me a, a higher degree of objectivity um, plus, I think the most important thing is that um, it allowed me to gain some more uh, interesting and valuable insights uh, that I didn't have before. Um, like, for instance, uh, one of the first and most important elements, discursive strategies that I analyze that identify uh, in Alexandria Casio Cortez's general election victory speech is the so called uh, inclusive we. Uh, which basically is when uh, someone uses the pronoun we uh, inclusively to encompass both the speaker and the addressees. Um, and mm, let's say that, uh, as Norman Fairclough, uh, Fairclough points out, um, the inclusive we is customarily used by uh, politicians to um, present themselves uh, as being part of the people when actually they're not. And the interesting thing to me uh, was that uh, AOC seems to be using this uh, strategy in the opposite way, uh, namely uh, for the depersonalization of uh, political power, in that she stresses the attention away from herself um, in order to um, emphasize the importance uh, of community instead, especially when it comes to the achievement of political success and in the overall improvement of society. And then you also analyze another aspect, a particular aspect uh, present in that particular speech, which is uh, the informality. Uh, how do you think um, how do you think that influenced the reception of the speech uh, by the audience? Um, well, uh, I think that her peculiar use of informality. Um, is a quite remarkable feat in that she manages to remain uh, like serious and professional, but at the same time, she creates this connection with her constituents at a deeper level. And uh, I think especially young people who uh, tend to feel more um, seen, uh, understood and uh, represented. Um, and, you know, I think that part the, the uh, the most important, the, the main reason for it is that uh, politicians tend to use informality uh, as a means to uh, exert power in a more uh, covered way. And um, by contrast, uh, AOC doesn't have to pretend she doesn't need to, uh, because she uh, really is a Hispanic uh, young woman from a working class family in the Bronx. And I think that this whole idea of uh, authenticity and genuineness uh, is crucial to her uh, message, to the narrative that she's trying to build. Uh, and it also contributes to this feeling of uh, effortle effortlessness that she conveys, not only when she's speaking to, um, to an audience, uh, but also in the creation of social media content. Um, and uh, she, she has made, she has turned uh, uh, Instagram and Twitter in particular into her um, primary means uh, of political communication. And she has shown, I think, uh, an impressive talent in the creation of social media content uh, um, in, since the very beginning of her first uh, congressional campaign in 2018. And te technology, again, is, is extremely important for her. As, as, I mean, yeah. in, in this particular um, analysis, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the essay of, uh, of Julia. And Professor Ciambella, again, we have language and community. In, in this case, perhaps it, it, it is even more pronounced, language, like community through language. Uh, do, do you have any impression on this? On, 
Well, actually, uh, I have to admit that I read Martina's article with great interest because I have two uh, students who are working at their um, at their thesis, and that covers somehow uh, some aspects of Martina's of Martina's article. On the one side, I have a student who's working on. Uh, the uh, New Yorican community in New York, that's to say the uh, Puerto Rican uh, people uh, migrated to New York uh, that established a, a, a huge community in, in New York that I, um, I, I have to admit, I, I didn't know anything about it, uh, but apparently um, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of debate on Twitter going on about this this community, and AOC, of course, is the most important representative um, of this um, Puerto Rican community in New York. That has yeah, yeah, uh, and that has yeah, she, <laughs> she, <laughs> um, and she also, um, I mean, her code switching and sometimes uh, resorting to to the Spanish language. Uh, is one of the characteristics of the of this kind of uh, um, Eastern Spanglish variety of American English, because we all know that the the Southwestern Spanglish is is widespread, quite widespread in uh, in those countries um, of the U.S. at the border with with Mexico. But I I personally didn't know anything about this this phenomenon of the Eastern Spanglish in in New York oh. thanks to this Puerto Rican community. Yeah, I think it's about creating a connection. Uh... As we were saying before, with informality, also this use of Spanglish is uh, very fascinating, yeah. especially uh, when we think about the idea of community that emerges from uh, not only this speech, uh, but in general, uh, I think her overall narrative. Um, and uh, as also um, uh, Andrea was saying at the beginning of the presentation of the issue, um, this community is deeply rooted in uh, NY14, uh, which would be New York's. Uh, I'm sorry, 14th congressional district, uh, which she now represents in Congress and which includes parts of Queens, Rikers Island and the, the, the Bronx. Um, and um, I think she's she at least seems to be very uh, attached to this territory and um, to the community there. Uh, and she has also shown, I would say on multiple occasions, uh, that she's actually uh, very proud of her uh, Puerto Rican origins. So she was also one of the first, uh, one of the few uh, politicians to um, advocate for the need um, for um, support, uh, economic support, especially uh, by the government uh, for the recovery of Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria hit in 2017 with disastrous consequences. So I think that's that's a very important part of it, yeah. Yeah, and also, um, um, excuse me, but uh, I cannot but uh, think about also the another fee, a very pivotal figure for the uh, American uh, current political situation that is, of course, the Vice President Kamala Harris. That exactly as um, exactly as AOC is a, is a black woman, of course, and she is a politician, uh, and she uh, in the in her speech you know, for um, um, on the day of, of the elections. Uh, she used the inclusive we a lot to uh, pinpoint at uh, the Black American community on the one hand, but also to uh, kind of include the, um, I mean, all the American women and probably also uh, women in the world uh, that are victims of of abuses and so on and so forth. So I, I really found some similarities between uh, um, the 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 critical discourse analysis you conducted on AOC's speeches and Kamala Harris uh, Kamala Harris's speeches um, about the Afro American community and Afro American uh, Afro American women in in general. I don't know if you if you have ever happened to to read. Kamala Harris's speeches, but I mean, they, they are quite very, very, very similar. Uh, yeah, there are some similarities, of course, but I think that 
they're two very different kinds of politician and this <laughs> certainly influences you know uh, the, the kind of political communication they they use and of course both of them made history and Kamala Harris in particular as you were saying before she became the first uh, uh, woman to be a uh, vice president uh, in the history of the United States but also the first uh, African American and Asian American vice president so of course it was uh, inclusive in, in more than one way uh, and uh, AOC also was uh, the first, the youngest um, uh, woman ever elected to Congress at age 29 in uh, 2018. Uh, but apart from that, I think they're just, there are so many differences, uh, um, like uh, starting from the fact that Kamala Harris is a moderate, she is a career politician, having served as a senator of California, and uh, she was a prosecutor before that. Um, and AOC had a completely different background, has a completely different background. She is a Bernie Sanders kind of progressive. And uh, before getting to Congress, she was virtually a nobody. Uh, she worked uh, as a waitress at a restaurant in Queens. So of course we have two very different personalities there. And I think this is also, this also informs uh, the policies they advocate for um, and but I think that maybe the, the different, the, the most important difference here is uh, age, uh, very simply put. Um, they belong to two very different generations. So you'll see some millennial. And I think that Kamala Harris is just right in between baby boomers and Gen Xers, uh, right? So, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I, that's, uh, I think that's um, especially at a moment uh, when. Uh, millennials are finally, are finally entering the political arena, bringing on their own personal experiences and ideas. This is a very important difference. And it also shows uh, uh, in the very different use of social media uh, by Kamala Harris on the one hand and AOC on the other hand. Kamala Harris is uh, barely visible there. Uh, and she's very, uh, you know, institutional while uh, by contrast uh, AOC, um, I think she understood very early in her career uh, that if she wanted her message or her narrative to work, people had to see her as a human, as a human being, as a person. <laughs> And so on the one hand, you have these very um, informative uh, political posts about, for instance, uh, how to get COVID relief, right? And on the other hand, you have these uh, sneak peeks into her uh, personal life, uh, like cute peeks of her dog. So it's, uh, and I think this contrast is the key to um, uh, her success on these platforms. Uh, I think it appeals uh, uh, to young people, especially very, very much. Yeah. And they're also quarreling a lot these days due to the fact that, I mean, they're, they're fighting a lot because uh, due to the fact that what Kamala Harris said about uh, immigration in, in the US and AOC had something to tell uh, Kamala Harris yeah. about, <laughs> ab about this more than something. I mean, yeah, quite, uh, quite, quite a lot. Yeah, it was yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and as far as communication is concerned, I, I remember in your, uh, in your essay, you've written that, um, well, I'm not quoting uh, exactly, obviously, but you, you, you said that. Um, uh, Ocasio, uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is some sort of heir to another very important political figure as far as their uh, communicative skills are concerned. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, uh, there's this uh, contrast because on the one hand, um, as a politician, she's often uh, compared to Bernie Sanders uh, and mm, just, you know, the media uh, generally uh, uh, pigeonhole her as uh, the, the heir to his political legacy. But on the other hand, I think that one thing that AOC has that Bernie Sanders doesn't is her uh, ability to communicate uh, hope, to give people hope. And I think that uh, that's where the Obama part of the comparison comes in. And uh, there's this um, uh, correspondent for Time magazine, Charlotte Alter, uh, who wrote uh, this uh, article and then a book about millennial politicians and AOC. 
and uh, she she has been one of the first uh, to make these these comparison and it has become uh, a thing she is extremely uh, you know uh, eloquent and uh, embodies the figure of the charismatic leader uh, in a way that uh, I don't want to exaggerate, but I think it's similar to, um, you know, the way Obama did it. Uh, it appeals uh, to uh, a very wide audience uh, and especially, especially young people. I think that's uh, mostly uh, the, the biggest part of her, uh, you know, uh, uh, of her supporters. Uh, followers uh, and constituents. And, and Andrea, I remember when I was um, you know, structuring the event, I was choosing uh, also uh, about what to speak. And I chose these two particular uh, essays because I, they have a particular relation. Uh, I don't know if you, um, if you remember, there is a, a particular song there is a particular song that actually speaks about, and here I'm, I'm, I'm telling the truth, speaks about the way Barack Obama uses English as a lingua franca. Are you aware? Yeah, what is it? I, I, I don't know if Andrea remembers this song. It's a very famous song. Uh, well, uh, actually, I'm not sure whether I've actually heard of it or not. So uh, sure. I will wait for the solution to come up. It was something like, oh, by myself, don't want to be. <laughs> it was very <laughs> So if you're asking yourself, this is the only reason I choose Giudia Castellano and Martina Shibila. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> no, obviously, uh, I'm joking. Twice, two false, I'm joking. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> again, to, to the guests. Uh, um, we, have, we have spoken about English as a lingua franca, um, com, uh, computer mediated communication, and so many other stuff, critical discourse analysis. But I'm, I'm sure you have, uh, you're, you're doing something else, you're having other interests, or you're, um, you're going deeper into your uh, proficiencies here. So I would like to start first with Julia. Uh, what are you doing right now? At the moment, um, actually, so yeah, I, mean, you know, I finished my studies one. a year ago. So um, it's an interesting period, this one, because uh, during my studies, I was um, uh, my interest lay in multiculturalism, intersectionality, in the use of language, and in again working across disciplines to examine how digital media platforms affect self identity and self expression. And now I've spent a year. Um, outside the university and I felt the need to go back to um, some research. So I think for the future, um, I think I will um, look back at the issues I dealt with uh, in these past years, but also um, my aim is to investigate um, how um, environmental sustainability is um, dealt with them in the communicate in political communication and how um, and what like um, how this how communicating these uh, environmental issues affect uh, um, the, the actual um, how do you say uh, the the come into um, so the, the realization of a more uh, environmental, uh, more sustainable society. What about you, Martina? Uh, well, so as you were saying before, we talked about like ELFs and C, SBA, <laughs> and it's funny because I think that most of the topics and disciplines that we study here at university come down to a three letter acronym and even <laughs> AOC if you think about it so <laughs> uh, there's no way out of it um, but I think that <laughs> the main ex exception for me would be uh, gender studies uh, which I'm very passionate about and which uh, influences uh, everything I write including this uh, article and uh, uh, the my what would be my MA thesis about um, uh, the speeches by AOC. And Professor Chambella, as as you told me when we first spoke about 
uh, the event as I invited you. Um, you. You told me you were uh, attending a summer school, if I'm not wrong, a particular summer school. Uh, can you tell us something about it? Yeah, I'm currently here in Verona teaching Romeo and Juliet to a group of 30, 38 students from uh, um, Israel, Palestine, Serbia, and only three from, from Italy, actually. And yeah, <laughs> something completely different from my, uh, I mean, from my field of, of research, but I, I'm, I'm currently teaching Romeo and Juliet. Uh, well, you, you were happy that there, there was uh, nothing about literature somehow in, in the issue. Yeah. Now, you are doing <laughs> literature in summer school, so, you know, yeah. uh, that's fair. <laughs> but to the, back to the issue itself, Andrea, we have shared the, the editing of this issue, not only in you, actually, it has been a great uh, team effort. And what I wanted to ask is, is, the, is this an experience to be editor of, any, of, of a transitions issue, something that you would recommend, something that you would, I don't know, repeat? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it has been quite of, a, of an experience, as you said. Um, it's been pretty intense. Uh, we, had, we have to think that issues um, take the form of, of a journey, actually, which lasts a few months, because we begin thinking about the issues, then we collect abstracts, we discuss the abstracts, we, we engage in a conversation with the authors up until the, the day before actually the, the, the publication of the issue in which we uh, double check the PDF um, looking for uh, extra spaces and uh, inconsistencies in the Oxford comma. So it, it's been a long journey. Um, I actually can say that I know some of the articles by heart now. Uh, having followed them through the whole process, but it's been really, really great. And um, I hope the authors who have collaborated with, with us uh, felt the same. Uh, but I really liked the exchange we had uh, with the authors and also with the editors. And uh, something really valuable um, that occurred uh, during the, the editorial process was, uh, I noticed how some of the authors uh, told us that the weaknesses uh, they they expressed a sort a sort of self assessment of their work, self criticism towards their work, and uh, I think this is something we are really looking at um, because it it encapsulates the idea of workshop in which uh, not only the authors but also the editors and the whole team can gain uh, can benefit from it. And uh, this is something which I felt was uh, especially compelling in, in this issue because, yes, we were talking about communities, but at the same time, we were thinking through communities and we were being a community. And the transitions goes on and on. We have future projects. And about this, I would like to, to invite uh, Paolo Di Sante, the acting uh, editor-in-chief, to give us some updates. Uh, yes, thank you, Leonardo. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me well, as my connection might not be working perfectly today. Uh, I'm more than happy to say a few words at the end of this inspiring event, even though only to make a couple of announcements. Uh, so first of all, please know that Transitions will host a creative writing workshop with uh, Marta Drogu in October. And if you wish to take part in it, you will probably have to fill in a form to book a place as places will be limited. Uh, you will soon find all the information on our website and social media accounts, which are strongly encouraged to uh, follow and check regularly. Uh, what is more, the editors of the next issue of our journal have just decided to extend the proposal deadline to the 1st of September. So you now have some extra time should you wish to submit an abstract or a creative piece. And you can find, again, everything that you need to know about this in the uh, announcement section of our website. Uh, so for now, I will limit myself to uh, tell you or remind you that the next issue is uh, due in November, will be edited by uh, Asia Battiloro and Lorenzo Zannini, and will revolve around the theme of the Anthropocene and possible futures. 
then also note that we are cur currently seeking human resources and event managers from Savianza University. The call uh, for applicants will be open until the uh, 20th of August. And again, you can find all the details about this call in the announcement section. So please check it out and submit your application if you wish to be part of the staff of transitions. Uh, as Leonardo was saying, and as you should know by now, the uh, community behind transitions is an ever-changing one. Uh, we found the members wanted it to be this way. And in fact, it has already begun to change. Uh, new members have joined the staff in the past few months and weeks, and some older senior members have already said goodbye or are about to do so. Uh, leaving to those who remain in charge of the project the responsibility of keeping the permanent workshop of transitions alive. I myself am going to say goodbye on Monday, but don't worry because I know for sure that Silvia Gatti will be, the, uh, will be transitions only editor in chief starting next week together with the rest of the staff, uh, will do a wonderful job. And in fact, I look forward to reading the next issues and taking part in the next event of Transitions. To conclude my uh, brief speech at the end of this, again, really thought-provoking and inspiring event, I wish to thank, to thank personally each and every member of the staff with whom I have had the pleasure to work and learn with since last November as well as all the authors who have contributed to the journal thus far, and all the guests, of course, that have taken part in our first uh, three events, including this, this one. Now let's go and read the July issue of Transitions, which by the way, uh, is out. So you can find it on our website. It has been published during the event. So now you can uh, easily uh, read it and download it from our website for free, of course. And I hope you will uh, all enjoy it as much as I did. So I will see you around, I guess. Thank you very much, Paolo. Um, I would like to say that there is an, uh, a bit of time left. So if, if anybody has any question for one of the authors, for Professor Ciambella or for uh, the editors of the issue, Andrea Lupi and me, but especially Andrea Lupi, um, please um, go on and raise your hand. There is, I think, the, uh, the possibility to raise literally your hand um, on Zoom. Um, I will put you beside us and we'll ask your question to whoever you want. And, and then I will also uh, like to thank Paolo Ninosante for uh, the great opportunity that he has given us to the, to the whole editorial staff, because thanks to his experience, uh, we have learned much. Uh, we have learned much about the editorial process. He has organized great uh, lectures, not only by him, but also by uh, inviting other members of uh, the editorial staff of transition, but also uh, from uh, personalities from the university. For example, we had a great lecture by uh, Professor Stalarico and her uh, experience uh, editing uh, academic stuff. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I don't see ra uh, recent hands. So I don't know if someone is thinking about a very long question. Uh, <laughs> But in such case, we'll wait a minute. Um, Professor Ciambella, will you read the next, or are you, you know, to uh, traumatized by this one, the next issue? Of course, I will. <laughs> well, I, I think we have already received uh, some abstracts for the next issue, and I, I think they are really, really promising. Um, I'm sure it will be as good as the others, the, the two other uh, issues we, we have, the one in March, the one in July, this one. So remember to be updated, uh, follow the Facebook group, the, the unupdated stage. Oh my God, I'm not the tough person that knows everything about this. Um, also on Instagram, we have also Twitter account, if I'm not wrong. You can find everything on the um, WordPress page that you can find linked in the chat. But again, I do not see reason hands. So I believe nobody has a question. We have been extremely clear. We have cleared all doubts even before they were advanced to us. So 
I like to start with the, uh, you know, with the thanking, with thanking everybody that has partaken to this this event. Thank you to the authors, Giulia Castellano, Martina Sibiglia. Uh, it has been great not only to have you here, but also to work with you uh, for the publication of your essays. Extremely interesting to read. Extremely interesting to work um, to work with you, sharing opinions, uh, sharing the editorial process. Uh, thank you to Andrea Lupi. Uh, this is a personal thank. Uh, he has helped me so much uh, with the editorial process, uh, paying attention to the issue. Uh, he has been uh, such a great uh, support. Actually, well, it, it has been a support to me. It's certainly not a, only a support for the issue. Uh, thank you again to Paolo Dinosante, always having our, our back, and to the whole uh to the whole editorial uh, editor staff editorial staff on, on only because we we i mean editorial board of transitions but we have three groups so the editorial board the editorial group uh the hr group and the social uh and uh graphic group uh thank to caterina napolitano the who has uh made that wonderful 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 uh first page for us um Thank to all of you. I really hope to see you, well, probably in October, but you know, you can just check on, on our social networks and we will hear from each other uh, whenever you follow us, whenever you check something is going on in transitions. So thank you again and goodbye to everybody. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.